In order to prevail, we must play the game better and take economic statecraft to the next level. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Our guests today on the path forward are Keith Kroc, a Silicon Valley CEO who served as Under Secretary of State uh, during the Trump administration, uh, responsible for economic growth, energy, and the environment. And with him, General Stanley McChrystal, the retired Army four-star general who served as commander of multinational forces in Kabul. Uh, and is now head of the McChrystal Group. We're going to be talking about ways the United States and the world can embrace new technology, uh, but also safeguard national security. And we're also going to talk about some other issues in the news. First, I want to thank uh, Keith and Stan for joining us. Thanks so much for uh, for having us, David. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So let me begin with the news uh, today. Uh, uh, President Biden is hosting. Uh, several dozen nations uh, in a worldwide uh, climate change summit uh, held on Earth Day. It's the president's biggest outreach yet to other foreign leaders. I want to ask you, starting with uh, Keith, what you, what you make of this and, and of the commitments the president is seeking from, from other countries. Uh, the Trump administration, which you served, pulled back from the Paris Climate Accords. Do you think that President Biden is wise to be moving back into a global climate alliance? And what do you see happening in the future? Sure. Well, David, we all want to take uh, action on climate change. You know, in my in my role in the State Department, my objective uh, was to optimize economic growth, energy security and the health of the planet. And that was for uh, the sake of maximizing our national security. And I think um, as you know, wars are, are started and lost because of, of, of energy. So I think uh, uh, focusing on this area is big and it is a, it is a national security uh, issue. Now, uh, the inconvenient truth of the inconvenient truth, though, in terms of clean energy, and I really think clean energy is, is the answer, it's technology, is that China pretty much has a monopoly. Uh, on particularly solar energy. And industry experts say uh, that by 2050, 50 to 70% of the world's energy will be by solar. Um, and, and, and so this is gonna be one of the biggest industries um, uh, in the world. I mean, it will rival computers, soft, uh, software, automobiles, and that also means a lot of jobs, a, a lot of GDP. The, the, the other, I think, really inconvenient uh, part of this is that the vast majority of solar cells uh, and also the raw materials like polysilicate that go into uh, this is made in Xinjiang. So this is where the United States has said that uh, punishable genocide is going on. And why do they do that? Well, they have super low labor costs. Uh, because they use the forced labor uh, from the Uyghurs and, and, and everything that, uh, you know, has been written about in, in Washington Post as well as elsewhere. Um, but also it's an extremely energy intensive process. Um, so uh, in, in order to, uh, the amount of energy that uh, a solar cell puts out, it takes three years to kind of pay back what it goes in, make it into that manufacturing process. And the reason why they do it in Xinjiang is they that's where their biggest coal mines are. And they have huge coal-fired plants. So 
This is, I think, uh, uh, not only a national security issue, but also a principal issue uh, for the United States. So uh, a lot going on uh, in your answer. Let me just uh, unpack a piece of it, um, which is how the U.S. should deal with China on climate issues. Uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry just got back from a trip to, to China in which he got uh, a general commitment from the Chinese to work with the U.S. to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Do you think that's a good idea? Should we be talking with China and trying to work with China towards that mutual goal? Or are you so uh, uh, concerned about China that you think we should stay away? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt we should be talking with them. As you know, they're the world's uh, largest and, and, and fastest uh, increase in terms of carbon emissions. So of course we should be working with that. But I think really my my point is that we've got to develop our clean energy uh, business. And they just announced, for example, uh, uh, green bonds uh, today. So this is where the United States is financing um, their energy business, which is financing what's going on in, in Xinjiang in terms of genocide. So I, you know, I think uh, the strategy's got to be, uh, it, it's got to keep all of this in mind. Um, so uh, there's, there's just no doubt about it that we've got to start cranking up uh, uh, in this area. And I also think that, you know, we're all, you know, we're free traders, but when somebody comes to the market, um, and doesn't play by the rules, the market's no longer free. And, and obviously they've subsidized their business um, and, and have done all kinds of things. It's classic, it's what they've done in many of the other high-tech sectors. So Stan, let me ask you to, to uh, look at today's uh, big news, that President Biden meeting with global leaders to talk about, about climate and ask you whether you think there's a national security benefit for the United States in rejoining this, this global effort to try to do something about climate change? Yeah, thanks, David. I think there is on two levels. I think on the first level, I believe that climate change is very real, a very real threat to the planet and therefore to everybody's continued existence. And there are people who argue about parts of that, but I think it's a problem that must be solved. The other part, which in the near term may be more important, is President Biden's willingness to step back into a leadership role. The United States and the presidency of the United States need to be seen as being responsible, willing to take on tough issues, and not take them on as a sole country, but as part of the international order. So I, I think this is an important step, even beyond just this particular issue, that the president is stepping back into a role that I believe is necessary. And, and Stan, let me ask you whether you think um, these efforts by the U.S. are, are seen as credible. Um, the, the world has uh, watched the United States pull back pretty radically over the last four years. Do you think that there's enough trust out there that the United States will be a reliable partner for, for the kind of initiative Biden has undertaken today to really work? David, I think it's been damaged. I do believe when people look at the United States and they see some of the statements by corporate leaders recently, which I think are going in a good, responsible direction toward the health of the planet and, and fellow citizens, I think that the American government is making the right noises now. But I think there's ground to be made up. I think that people believe that if we are not genuine about our commitments or we don't follow through on them in the long term, that they are natural if they start to hedge their bets with us. So what we've got to do over time is show consistency on key issues and the resolve to, to make tough choices, sometimes which cost us in the short run, run, but they help strengthen our position in the world in the long run. Keith, before we leave uh, this issue, I'd be interested in your response. Do you think that the United States uh, suffered some damage by separating itself from international uh, uh, consensus on some of these issues? Well, I think, um, you know, it is so important for the United States uh, to lead on, on so many of these issues. And I think you hit on uh, actually what I think is the most important thing, uh, the most important word in any language. 
and that is trust. It's the basis of every relationship, uh, business, personal, otherwise. You partner with people you trust, you do business with people you trust, um, and these trust principles that make up our democratic values are key. And these are things like integrity, reciprocity, um, transparency, respect for rule of law, respect for property, respect for sovereignty, respect for the planet, respect for human rights. And this is always what the United States uh, has has stood for. And, you know, that is, the, uh, you know, the basis of our alliances, which is just such an important strength um, for the United States. You know, when I when I was asked by the Senate, what would be my uh, strategy? What would be my focus with regard to the China challenge? What I said was harness uh, the three biggest areas of competitive advantage for the United States, and that is further strengthen our relationship with our allies and our friends, leverage the innovation and resources of the private sector and amplify the moral high ground of democratic values. And, and, and that's something that we were able to do uh, with the clean network. So let's, let's turn uh, Keith to the, to the clean network and the larger issue of how we protect uh, our technology in a period of a rapid uh, Chinese challenge. This, uh, it seems to me, is one idea where there's some continuity, although people haven't uh, said much about it, between Trump administration policies and your clean network and, and the Biden administration's desire to get uh, democracies together on the same uh, uh, playing field on technology. So let me just ask you to lay out what your idea during the Trump administration was on clean networks and how you think that effort is working. Sure. So when I came in uh, to government, my charge was to develop and operationalize a global economic security strategy that would drive economic growth, maximize national security, and also combat economic uh, aggression. Uh, and so what we did is we developed a model, and basically that's the clean network model. The, the, the first issue that we addressed, which was really the beachhead, was was 5G. And so the, the, the clean network is an alliance of democracies. Uh, and, and it is comprised of countries, companies, and civil society that operate by a set of trust principles for all these areas. So when uh, about exactly a year ago, um, the, uh, Huawei announced 91 5G uh, deals around the world, 47 in Europe. It looked like they were unstoppable. They were going to run the table. Up to that point, the United States was literally going around the world and pounding on the table and saying, don't buy Huawei. Uh, when we got the authorities for that, I said, you know, hey, why don't we just treat our the, the countries uh, that we're trying to work with and the companies, let's treat them like a customer and have a real value proposition. And it, it was a very successful. Um, at the end of the day, we defeated uh, the CCP's master plan to col uh, control 5G uh, communications. We also exposed their biggest weakness, and that was trust. And David, in my, in my first like 60 bilateral meetings with my foreign counterparts, whether they're economic ministers, finance ministers, uh, or their deputies, and, you know, I, I'd have a bilateral with them and I go, how's your relationship with China? Well, they're pretty important. They're, you know, one of our top trading partners. And then they look both directions. They lean in and they go, but we don't trust them. And and all as I know, you know, especially coming from DocuSide, where you have people's most important documents, trust is everything. So we made that our, our strategic position so that when we would talk to countries and companies, we, we would just ask them a question. And that is, would you trust the Chinese Communist Party with your citizens' personal data, with your corporations' intellectual property, with um, your your government's most important information? And it, and it really it really got them thinking. So at the end of the day, uh, we got sixty like-minded countries on the clean network, representing two thirds of the world's global GDP. 200 telcos and a host of uh, industry-leading companies on that clean network. And this is really in alignment 
with what President Biden uh, has been talking about, and that is the power of our alliances. And and uh, I remember seeing a, a speech by Secretary Blinken uh, in July, right where we were in the middle of it. And he was talking about, look, when we work with our allies and our partners, that could represent 50 to 60% of the GDP. So that actually happened. And so our first objective was to, was to defeat their master plan. The second was to create uh, a duplicatable, repeatable model. And indeed that did happen. And by the way, the, uh, we also announced for clean cloud, clean apps, clean underwater cable, but it, it and I also foreshadowed, uh, clean drones, clean Internet of Things, clean AI, clean cars, clean currency. So I think this is really the magic formula. And it goes back to that Senate confirmation. Uh, I mean, in terms of harnessing the power of our allies and our private sector and and amplifying um, democratic values. Uh, and, um, you know, I think this is the great thing is I believe we gave the Biden administration a real head start on this. Um, because uh, my last two companies, DocuSign, we built the DocuSign Global Trust Network with a billion users. And before that, uh, we invented B2B e-commerce uh, and the Ariba Network now has $3 trillion worth of uh, transaction that goes through it on an annual basis. And the toughest part about starting a network is uh, getting that thing going. So um, I really hope that uh, um, uh, this will be really taken advantage of, and, and and I'm actually here this week in D.C. I'm meeting a lot. Uh, I'm meeting with a lot of officials from the Biden administration about this. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I do think uh, there is a lot of continuity between uh, your uh, initiative uh, on this alliance of democracies and what what the Biden administration speaks of as a similar effort to to gather the techno democracies. I'm always looking for points of continuity and and shared uh, shared policy. And this, I think, you're right, Keith. This this is one. Stan, I, I want to ask you, from a, a hard national security standpoint, what you think is the danger of a world where the telecommunications, 5G infrastructure around the world is dominated by China? W what kind of world would that be from a national security pr perspective? David, it would be problematic if we think of any time when any nation or block of nations controlled part of international commerce, for example, controlled the seas or controlled certain natural resources like uh, natural gas or oil. For You make dependencies of people who otherwise would like to be able of independent, capable of independent action. And so once you're dependent, you don't have the ability really to push back very much. And so the ability first to make people do what you want them to do, other nations do what you want them to do by turning the spigot on and off. Or in the case of something like uh, information technology, potentially leveraging the power that information technology for misinformation of other activities. So. It really, it goes as far as your imagination can go. When you talk about the absolute loss of sovereignty, it comes from the loss of control of things like that. I, I know for me, uh, looking at this issue of, of Huawei and 5G, the public uh, open source reporting by Britain's communications intelligence agency, GCHQ, was a real um, eye-opener. Uh, Keith, I want to ask you about alternative technologies down the road. The funny thing about Huawei and its version of 5G is that there are a lot of people who think uh, it's kind of the Ma Bell of, of 5G about to be disrupted by new technologies, uh, in particular one called Open Radio Access Networks or ORAN. Uh, the worry is about the transition the next few years before ORAN's really ready. Uh, share with our viewers your, your sense of how this telecommunications picture is likely to unfold and whether there is an alternative technology that would just basically knock Huawei out of the box. Sure. Um, and and uh, first, I'd kind of like to pick up a little bit on Stan's point. I mean, the importance of control and uh, uh, for the CCP, if they control that uh, the communications. Um, look, I, I, 
I was sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party, you know, for an old Ohio boy like me who grew up, you know, welded in his dad's five person machine shop, uh, who had a chance to live the American dream. This is the highest form of flattery. I would never imagined this, the general secretary would uh, sanction a guy like me. Uh, and and what that means is that that show uh, what an effect and how important it was for them, because uh, by the time we were done, those 91 5G contracts went down to probably less than a couple dozen. Um, and 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 so one of the big reasons, David, for doing this was to uh, raise the pricing umbrella that was created by Huawei because of all these uh, subsidies and, and being able to lower their costs because of all their intellectual property theft. Uh, you didn't see the big... Uh, Microsoft's, Dell's, um, Cisco's of the world jumping in this space. You didn't see the innovators coming in. So the objective was to neutralize and to lift the pricing umbrella so that um, new technologies can come in. And indeed that's happening. Cowan just put out a report uh, last week uh, about that. And so what we see happening in that, you know, let's call it the, the sixth generation, is the opening up in terms of interoperability. And the analogy that I would draw would be just like the PC business. So when uh, Steve Jobs invented the Mac, everything was integrated, the hardware, the operating system, the applications. But then IBM and, and actually it was Microsoft came in with the operating system and it created interoperability. So all of a sudden you've got IBM, Compact, HP, all these guys making computers, and then you've got all these applications on top of it. And what it did is it drove down uh, the cost for that next generation and allowed um, uh, companies to focus and to innovate. And indeed, that's what we see happening out there in the future for 5G. But that pricing umbrella needed to be lifted and uh, Huawei needed to be uh, uh, neutralized. So, uh, I Thank you for that. And for this picture of a, of a telecommunications space that's evolving. Stan, uh, I know our viewer, viewers would want me to ask America's former commander in, in Kabul what, what you think about President Biden's announcement that he is going to be withdrawing all U.S. troops, all the remaining 2,500 troops before September 11. Uh, we had General McKenzie, the CENTCOM commander on the Hill this week, uh, delivering some pretty stern warnings about the potential dangers that could result from that uh, troop withdrawal. You know this uh, landscape as well as anybody, and I'd be very interested in your evaluation about the withdrawal plan and the dangers that come with it. Great. Thanks for asking, David. Um, I'll start. Like most people who've served in Afghanistan, there's an emotional component to my thinking about Afghanistan, and I can't deny that. I, I grew to love the Afghan people in the country. So while the decision that President Biden made was difficult, I respect it. I would not have wanted to make, have to make that decision. But what I think we need to do now is say, what do we have to do to implement the reality that he has laid out as best as possible going forward? And I think that's gonna require several things. I think the first thing it requires us to do is say, what are our interests in the region? What influence do we want to retain? What do we want to be able to prevent in terms of things like Al Qaeda's reemergence or other activities? And what do we don't think raises to a threshold that warrants American involvement directly, even in small numbers? So I think we need to do a really hard look at that. We need to communicate that to our allies and to the people who might be opposed to us in the region in a way that demonstrates exactly what you mentioned earlier in the conversation about consistency and resolve. Because if we state a policy, but people don't believe that we actually have the intention to carry that out over time across multiple presidential administrations, potentially at different parties, then it starts to lose credibility. And then the, the larger picture, and I've done a lot of thinking about this, and I think other veterans as well, what are the lessons to be learned from the Afghan experience? And if we extrapolate back towards Vietnam and other engagements that the nation has, 
there is a temptation to say that there was some strange reason why it didn't come out like we wanted it to, and it's not our fault. I don't think that's correct. When I say our fault, I say that I don't buy into the idea that Afghanistan was an unachievable objective. But I think that we made a number of mistakes in terms of lacking a clear strategy and a narrative that supports that. I think we made a number of mistakes in implementation in terms of whether we could align the different parts of our effort together. And I bring these up because we are going to have the choice to get involved around the world in other cases. And so what it asks us to do is go to school and say, what did we get wrong last time that we can't afford to get wrong again? Because if we don't do that, then we'll be probably doomed to the same kind of frustration that, that uh, many of us feel now. That's, uh, that's, that's helpful. I, I wanna ask uh, Keith, this withdrawal uh, effort really began as a, as a proposal by President Trump, negotiated by his special envoy, Zal Khalilzad, in the administration that, that you served. Do you support President Biden's decision to, to get out? It's a little later than the May 1 deadline that, that Trump had set, but do you think it's a good idea? Well, by the way, the first thing I wanna do is thanks Dan for all his service. Um, he's one of the most courageous persons uh, I've had a, a chance to know and, and such a great friend. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of the things that I learned coming in the government uh, where I, uh, you know, I've never been here bef uh, in the government before. And what I learned is that um, the North Star is national security and democracy is uh, an unnatural act. It's just an experiment for 200 years. It goes against all the laws of physics. Uh, the natural laws are the bad king, the dictator, the emperor. And we have to fight every day to preserve that democracy. And without the United States, um, I don't know, 50 to 100 countries would be under that bad king. It would be under that repression. Uh, and that's why I have so much re respect. And, and, and you know, uh, what I tell my friends back in Silicon Valley, just like when you see a military, uh, somebody served in the military, and when you see a civil servant or a career foreign service officer, you thank them for their service because uh, it is all about national security. You know, when it comes to questions on the military, I'm going to defer to Stan, David, if you don't mind. Well, I, fair enough. The uh... The, the, the this was a this was a policy uh, that uh, that President Trump uh, and his State Department began, uh, and uh, so again, what, what we're seeing is is some continuity. I want to uh, close. We have only a couple minutes left with a, a broad question. Um, I'd like to put to both of you. I'll, I'll start with Stan, and and then ask uh, Keith to to close up. President Biden has really put a stress. Uh, in his speeches, talks with the country on uh, bipartisanship, on somehow trying to restore some unity in a country that is has been badly divided. And I want to ask each of you, starting with Stan, how you think he's doing. Stan, how's, how's that effort to put the country back together going? David, I think it's essential. Um, and I think that the steps being made are appropriate so far. I don't see it working yet. I think there's a certain recalcitrance on both sides. As you know, people who've been arguing and fighting are sometimes very difficult to get them to, to let down their guard to interact. But the criticality of the effort is so great. If in a democracy, if the basic function of governance, the ability to reach compromise solutions doesn't work, you don't have a functioning democracy. When you don't have that, you have a weakened nation. So of all the priorities that the president has to pursue, to me, this is number one. Keith, uh, what do you hear from your Republican friends? Here in Washington, we see a very polarized uh, Congress on just about every issue, but I, I'm curious whether out in the country, there's any more uh, coalescence of, of views uh, behind this president, but but even more behind the idea that somehow we've got to become more unified. 
Well, um, I, I just had a, a number of congressmen over my place here uh, in Georgetown uh, last night. And I, I can tell you the biggest unifying bipartisan issue of our time is that biggest existential threat represented by uh, General Secretary Xi, how he stepped up uh, his aggression. And uh, I think what the administration has done uh, so far is, I mean, they're on it. And um, we haven't seen him uh, stepping back from uh, some of the groundwork we were able to lay. And, uh, you know, this last fall, uh, as we were assembling the clean network, I went to about 40 countries. And what I saw is an awakening. I saw citizens of the world waking up to the Chinese Communist Party's uh, three-pronged doctrine of concealment, co-option, and coercion. And you could see citizens of the world understand that the pandemic is a result of the of the concealment of the virus. You could see that people understood that the co-option of Hong Kong resulted in the evisceration of its citizens' freedoms. And they also heard about the coercion in Xinjiang and how it's grown into punishable uh, genocide. And they don't like it. And, you know, one of the things as uh, I'd be over there and I'd talk with them is that I said, look, this whole China issue, this is a unified bipartisan issue. This means a lot to our allies because it means continuity of policy. And it terrifies the Chinese Communist Party that we're unified on that. So on that, I give them high marks. So uh, that's a good way to end our conversation. Uh, appreciate both of you talking about a range of issues. Uh, Keith Kroc and General Stan McChrystal, uh, thanks for joining us on Washington Post Live. Good to have you. Thanks. Thank you, David. So uh, we will be uh, continuing today with uh, a full slate of programming. I'll be back at 2 o'clock this afternoon uh, with the CEO of the software giant SAP uh, to talk about employee mental health issues, a, a subject on which he is uh, one of the leaders. Thanks for joining us on Washington Post Live, and we'll see you later.